So we are moving on. Please sit down. Slovenia is uh, on the scene. I think this is uh, just as interesting as the last one. The theme this time is uh, biomechanical difficulties in basic ex exercises in ski teaching. So uh, we have an expert here. Come on, come out to me. Welcome, Mate. Thank you. Mate uh, uh, has been a skier for the whole of his life, of course, as the most of you in here. Uh, he's also a biomechanical expert. He's on the demo team of Slovenia and former racer of Slovenia. Very welcome you are. Now the stage is yours. Okay, thank you for the presentation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, friends, it's uh, really an honor for me to be here to present part of our Slovenian efforts in Slovenian uh, skiing. So I hope you will join me all 30 minutes because for the end, I have a little presentation here, which is a little bit surprising, probably. I don't want to uncover this before the end. Anyway, uh, in case somebody shoots me now, this is not part of performance. Uh, as you can see, as it was already said on the beginning, uh, the title Biomechanical Limitations of Basic Exercises in Alpine Ski Teaching is the topic. Uh, as a colleague before me said, I will talk about very important stuff in skiing. And uh, I will start with a little bit history, because when I talk to people, they normally don't really know when carving was really born. And here I have original documents from the 69, 1969, 1970, from Elan Begunje, engineer Andrei Robic. This was his first documents of how carving skis should work. So this is really the beginning, and we are very thankful to the father of carving. So the next step, what Elan really did, is to build carving skis. So this was quite early in the year, in the year 1984. The first carving skis uh, were built, and they are actually quite advanced even for nowadays. As you can see, these skis has variable side cut. So you can find skis like that even today. So very unfortunately, at that time, Europe was too conservative to accept carving. So it was many attempts, many years going on. And uh, finally, uh, in the beginning of the 90s, you can see that uh, carving actually make a first boom in the United States. So I don't think there is many skis so sexy as extreme side cut alliance skis that were posing for Playboy. So as you can see here on the right side. So of course, for those, uh, for those times, carving was uh, a big thema, uh, and uh, all the nations were trying to build carving ski school, uh, the basics, the methodology of carving. And uh, one of the problems was that on the beginning, most of the ski schools were dealing with good, good skiers, teaching them how to carve. And of course, uh, one of the efforts which we were doing in these years were to understand what is the difference really on the field between carving and between skidding turns. So we built a book which is a little bit different according to other alpine skiing mechanics because this one was really dealing with the methodology, how to teach skiing according to biomechanical law. So it's a little bit different. So I'll just give you a few very brief examples uh, what was in the history. So if you look at these slides, so we have the principle of skidding turns. So if you look at the ski here on the top, we have a wedge position of the skis. And the principle is that the snow drag impact, so the snow actually hits the skis, which makes you slow down along the longitudinal direction. And on the other side, it makes you turn to the right in this particular example. So if this would be enough for skiing, then the skiers would be like skiing, if you remember, old video games, Space Invaders, just like left, right. So of course, it is important also that the body turn r turns around along the longitudinal axis. So this is then the next step which should be considered, and this is what I'll explain 
in a simplest possible manner here on the right side. So if you look at this picture on the right side now, so if we have equally loaded skis on the right side, we go straight ahead. So then, of course, when we load one ski more than the other, we get the situation where there is more snow hitting the ski from this side than it is from the right side. And there is another important thing, that it is more snow hitting the front part of the ski than it is the back part of the ski. Of course, it is a little bit more complicated with the real skis, but the basics is like that. So this actually makes the torque on the skis that the skis really turn on the right side in this particular case. So the, the next step is to identify the difference which we all remember from the old school was the biggest problem is how to change from one to the next turn. So if we have a wedge position, it's quite easy to come from one to the other side, ending one turn, just load the other ski and start the next turn. But when we have parallel skis, it's a problem here in between because you have on the end of the turn skis like that, and if you want to turn the next, uh, the ne if you want to start the next turn, you have the skis on the other, you need to have the skis on the other side. So this is something where it's missing. And here, it's of course very important to have the uh, pl uh, planting the ski pole. So as you can see, you get a force impact on, on the skier here, and this actually helps you turn you around. So this is a very important issue. And examining this particular case about uh, planting the pole, it's also important the timing when you do it. So these were just a few examples uh, of taken off from this old book. But one of the good things in biomechanics is that if you, if you throw the ball in the air, it always falls down. So even if it's old, it's still true. So now we come to another principle, it's principle of curve turn. So this is basically more or less the same Im images as you could see uh, from my first slides from Mr. Andre Robic. The only difference is that, of course, these are uh, plotted with the computer. Uh, but uh, one of the important differences if we, if we compare skidding turns compared to carving turns is that we have actually a direct relationship between edge angle and turn radius. So this is completely different principle of how the skis really turn. And this was one of the key things to understand when you want to build a proper ski school. Because if you know how to carve, that doesn't mean you know how to ski it, and vice versa as well, of course. So these books, our official Slovenian ski school, are actually a consequence of all this previous work, putting together the biomechanical laws, the experience, the methodology, and putting together. So now I will talk a little bit about our methodology, and then I will present some of the measurements. So this is the main concept of our ski school, where, of course, we have different ways how you come from the beginner up to the expert. And if I just move this slide up, so basically, we have different levels of skiing. And for me now, the most important, which I will talk about, is these basic forms of skiing and advanced forms of skiing. So if you look how these elements are uh, approaching one after another, we have first ski curves with wedge turns. So this is kind of a snowplow skiing. Then we have turns with a wedge push-off. And then we have basic turns. So this is actually the basic forms of skiing in our ski school. And then we have advanced forms of skiing, which is turns in the wide and turns in the narrow corridor. This is basically what you most of the time see on the slope while the demo teams are having their shows. So despite the fact that we built our ski school on the foundations of biomechanics, we wanted really to see if our ski school does apply the limitations of biomechanics. And one of the things we wanted to test first is, does it go through velocity barriers? Does it, does it obey also motor task, which is important? How much time do you have to do some motor task? And this was the study that we did. And here is just a brief uh, explanation of our methodology. So we have a very precise global navigation satellite system, which basically captures United States and Russian satellites at the same time. 
It retrieves one centimeter horizontal and two centimeter vertical accuracy. It's very reliable. And of course, it was synchronized with the camcorder. And uh, a little bit behind the scene, it's not just having the equipment. It's also a little bit what you need to do beside that because you measure the antenna position. And of course, what you need is to have your center of mass skiing and your skiing trajectory. I will not go into explanations of this very far. But this is something what you get out from the measurement like this. And the test protocol for our project or our little project where we wanted to evaluate our ski school was like this. So we took our five basic ski school elements, as I explained before. We took our eight elite demo team skiers, which were also present on the slopes these days, showing you what we can do. And what we were also observing is different turn phases, like having the uh, phase of traverse skiing, then the phase of going the skis from the uh, parallel to the wedge position. So these were like basic turn phases. And what we really uh, then analyzed is using this equipment, going through all the, the elements with synchronized video, with all the parameters. So it's also some about energy, about forces. Uh, so it's all sorts of stuff, which is maybe not so important now to present you. But this is what is important. So first, we see that we have a very nice progress in velocity. So if you look from our first element going down, we see quite nice increase of velocity. So we are slowly lifting up the barrier. And we observe that the differences between our demo team members, which are, let's say, the elite ski instructors, were very small in the performance, which is quite good to have a solid ski school. So the next thing what we, what we observed is, and it, it is very important for ski school, is this beginning here. It's in each of the elements is the increase of velocity. So meaning that when you start performing your elements, the first turns are always much slower than the next ones. And this is not so critical if you don't go behind that and understand that the velocity also influence forces and forces influence your balance positions. So basically, if you can do, let's say, one turn to the left and one turn to the right, that doesn't mean that you will be able to combine two turns one after another. So this is what is quite critical. Another aspect which we were really worried about was how much time we have for the shortest turn phases. So this is how much motor task the skier learning skiing should do in a period of learning. And we saw quite nice decrease of time. So this would be element number one, element number two, three. So we see that the time to complete different, the shortest turn phases is nicely decreasing. We only see the difference here, of course, narrow corridor is having shorter uh, shortest turn phases shorter than the wider corridor. That's quite obvious. But also in our schema, in our ski school, these two elements are on the same level. So for example, here you see element number two, and this is one of the turn phases presented. So this is one of the turn phases, and this is basically the mean time of our demo team members uh, to complete this turn phase. So another step was when we thought about children. So children are different than all the people. So we all know that in ski school. And here, it's not enough biomechanics. Biomechanics is the foundation. But we also need to go into the child development because this is really crucial thing. And another thing which is also important is that the children especially children, everybody, but children especially, should really have fun. So this is also why the book is called Skiing is a Game. So another application of our ski school was how to teach handicapped people, which is also presented here. But we went another step aside, and what we wanted to do is to examine how to help them to ski better when they're handicapped. So we, what we did is we took 
healthy skiers, we observe their kinematics of movement, how they move when they ski, and we try to predict how the art leg or the sport knee or this artificial knee, as you can see here, should work to be best for skiing. And, of course, you can see that these are different types of measurements, and this one, the black one in the middle, is what you get out from our new developed art leg sport knee for skiing. And, of course, here you have the skier using this artificial uh, knee for skiing, or prosthetic knee. And he is also, these days, here with us. You will be able to meet him, and you can observe how he ski. And now for the end, I wanted to show you a video, and I want you to look very close if you see something strange on this video. So now you probably know what I have in here. So this might be the future ski. So I suppose that a lot of you are skeptic, but maybe I should rephrase the question, how many from you are from Europe? <laughs> this is really how this ski looks like, and it works. So this is basically a prototype so you can put it together, put the bindings on, and you can go skiing. Believe it or not, it works very well. So for the end, I would like you to invite you all to come to our table back, backside. And if you're interested in our ski school, in our works, there are some books to see if you want to go a little bit further into that knowledge what I had only a brief time to present. Okay, so now I'm waiting for... Okay, I'm supposed to be talking. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to learn more on the ski area, please join our skiing agents. They will be delightful to help you and to explain a bit more what I, what I was trying to, to tell you in a, this short time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mate. Wonderful. Now you could look into the future. Do you dare to join their workshop? We'll see that on Thursday. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll start the General Assembly of uh, IFSI, IVSI. Uh, so, uh, thank you for attending the key lectures today, and have a nice evening for you who are leaving here, and also a nice day skiing tomorrow together out in the sun on the excursion day. Thank you. <laughs>